and welcome to another episode of the Capital Record. I am your host, David Bonson of the Bonson Group, and today we are bringing on yet another guest as a repeat performer, and it is a very special episode because it's a little off subject from our normal uh, uh, categories of defending free enterprise, talking about the Fed, talking about markets, uh, although I actually do think this topic kind of interacts with all those things in a number of ways, but I'm bringing back on one of the guests we had early on in Capital Record, my very good friend, hedge fund uh, extraordinaire, uh, host of the SALT Conference, and former White House Communications Director, Anthony Scaramucci, CEO and founder of Skybridge Capital. Anthony, welcome back to Capital Record. David, thanks for having me on. I apologize that I don't look as old school as you do with the white collar, which is absolutely fantastic. I was on vacation, and so I don't have my uh, my typical Brioni with me, so I apologize for that, but I'm happy to be on, and uh, I, had, I had a great time last time. Now, are your Brionis, custom, you're, you're, they're tailored, or do you do like Trump did, where he would buy a $20,000 suit, but then not get it tailored? No, I mean, my shit's totally tailored. I mean, come on. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, yeah, let, let me tell you, as you know, I grew up in a blue collar family. I tell a very funny story about my first job interview at Goldman. I'm in 100% polyester. I've got a black Guido tie on. I'm fully flammable. Okay, my, my shirt is actually polyester because you didn't, you could just throw those in the washer and dryer. Um, and the partner from Goldman says, you know, you're a smart kid, but you're the worst dressed person that we've met at the Harvard Law School. So from that day forward, all I did was buy like uh, high design fabrics. Yeah. Okay. What can yep. I tell you? Snobbery, snobbery. It's not dress for the job you want. Yeah. Listen, you got to do that. I mean, I, I, I feel like, uh, I'm, you know, intellectually, we're going to spar here a little bit. And I feel like you're out dressing me. Uh, I almost feel like running down the block to get a tie. It was a power move on my part. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You're, doing, you're doing well, but you look yeah. good. No, this is you, are, this is you are an intellectual giant, but I do think we disagree on a few things. So I appreciate we, we, you bringing me on so that I could at least share my views and also give my assessment of what's going on in terms of our foreign adversaries infecting our society and really driving divisions in our tribes and our culture. Yeah. So let me set this up for the audience real quick. And and I will make a couple of things real clear when he talks about us disagreeing. It's an interesting disagreement because it's one in which there's a lot of overlap. Uh, but we're going to talk about the, the issue of vaccinations. We're talking about Delta variant. We're talking about COVID. Um, all of this stuff, the entire COVID ecosystem has generated a lot of discussion for a year and a half. There's people that have strongly held opinions and there's people that have changed strongly held opinions. There's people that have fought with others about them. There, there's all this stuff, like most things in society, there's a lot of division, tribalization. Here's the one thing that may let some of you down a little. Anthony and I are not here to break up a friendship over a disagreement on the issue. Exactly. There, there exactly. are shared premises that we both have which is that we desperately want safety of American people. We want good policy response. There may be right. differences and tactics and things, but, but no, we're, we're here to kind of hash out some things. And why I said early, I think it does sort of have some connectivity to free enterprise, to freedom, to capital records kind of mission is obviously from head to toe, COVID has economic repercussions. It has political touch points. And so th this really does, I think, belong in Capital Record. And I'm going to start by just letting Anthony do what he said. I'd like you to just sort of lay out what your position is now. A lot of these things were highlighted in an interview you did with William Cohen, well-known uh, Vanity Fair writer. I read some of it last week. I took exception to a couple of the things you said, not everything. I texted you. You cussed at me. I cussed back at you. And now here we are on Capital Record to to talk about it like grown-ups. Well, let me let me say one thing about our society from an intellectual perspective. Okay, we've gone back to fuses. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember my dad switching out the fuses in our house and putting in circuit breakers. You know, he did it himself. He was a blue-collar guy. Uh, thank God he didn't blow the house up. But a fuse, it burns out. So if somebody disagrees in our society now, the fuse burns out, and then that's it. We now are polarized, we hate each other, 
we send invective towards each other and all of the polemics associated there too. Uh, I want to go back to circuit breakers intellectually where we can have a disagreement, the circuit breaker snaps and you flip the switch, you put it back on. Uh, it is so important for us right now to fix the society and to create more tribal and intellectual unity. So we can disagree and we can disagree forcefully and vigorously but if we become overly disagreeable with each other, David, we end up in a situation where we are in a quagmire together. And um, I, I, I wanna go to the Americans of the past who whatever their differences were, when there was a crisis, they fortified and unified uh, and made things happen. You know, Charles Vandenberg, as an example, he didn't agree with a lot of the things that Truman was doing. He was a Republican from Ohio. Uh, but he recognized the scourge of communism. He recognized the uh, expansion of communism left unchecked. And so he teamed up with Truman. Now, they didn't have to agree on everything, but they got a lot of things right. Uh, and the post-World War II architecture led to a very prosperous America and a very aspirational blue-collar America, which I lived in. So, so I want to I get back there. But the, the, the vaccinations, uh, to me are in that spirit of an age old America where Jonas Salk invents the polio vaccine. Is it perfect? It is not. The small packs vaccination, I know you're familiar with the 1905 James, you know, Jacobson versus Massachusetts case where the Supreme Court rules that Massachusetts can mandate the small packs vaccine in light of the pandemic and the healthcare situation. Now you fast forward into the United States where we are today, and we are, in my opinion, we are victims of all this great science. We're victims of all this great success of these vaccines, and frankly, the success of our political system and our freedoms, and now we're perverting those. Uh, moreover, at the same time that we're doing that, we have a group of foreign adversaries, specifically the Russians and the GRU and the KGB, that have created robotic technology in our social media space, have invented identities. They look like Americans. They sound like Americans. They're based in parts of the country, but they're actually at server farms in Moscow, instigating broad-based division in the society and in the culture to split the society and to weaken the society. And, and good leadership requires, at this moment in our history, to explain that to the American people, and explain the need to uh, have a vaccine mandate and why that vaccine mandate is important, not only for themselves and their families, our public health system and our commerce. You are more free being vaccinated than you are not being vaccinated. Okay, so you go ahead. Well, so far there's not much I agree other than just the addition of the concept of a mandate where uh, to the extent that there are foreign adversaries that spread disinformation, um, I think there are two villains in that, the, uh, the foreign adversaries who spread disinformation and the platforms that allow it, that have every capability in the world of stopping it. Um, at some point, we'll get to a point, and this is like a whole nother podcast and probably a whole nother series of podcasts. I already had Senator Mike Lee on Capitol Record to talk about some of the debates amongst big tech. There is no reason we can't get to it. What if Citibank or JP Morgan allowed me to have a credit card for me, and then I created 15 fake aliases to also have a credit card? Okay, it's ridiculous. It can't happen. So the fact that there are so many fake users on various social media platforms is why a fake disinformation campaign from a foreign adversary is allowed to happen. It could be stopped in a second if Silicon Valley wanted it to. But my, but my point is that you and I share this much in common. I'm not here to debate you on the efficacy of vaccines. I'm also not here to debate about the merits to the society if more are vaccinated. And in fact, I am here to debate what is the most effective way to get more people vaccinated. The issue at play is merely a disagreement over tactic. Is federal mandating a way to go you brought up a smallpox and polio analogy. The polio was not federally mandated. Uh, the uh, children were um, forced to be. Uh, you had a 32% mortality rate. We have a 0.2% 
mortality rate. It's a lot of people. It's a tiny fraction of how many people die in car accidents. It's a tiny fraction of how many people die of drug abuse, of, of um, heart disease, of other behavioral conditions, but it's all a tragedy. The, the, the targeted amount of deaths I would like to have from a viral disease or other behavioral conditions is zero. But you and I are not utopians. We do not believe zero death is a legitimate policy goal or even a fair conversation for grown adults. It cannot and will not happen. So we're talking about mitigation. And when we talk about mitigation, we talk about balance. You brought up strong leadership. Leaders don't get to pretend that there's a world without trade-offs. There is a tension between freedom and security. And th that same tension exists when we talk about things like post 9-11 policy, Patriot Act, foreign entanglements. But when we talk about security with COVID, the same is true. So all we're talking about is juxtaposing two principles that are crucial to the founding and crucial to your and mine's shared worldview. And my view is that a federal mandate of the vaccine that I want to see would hurt the cause of getting more vaccinated, particularly in a time of this level of tribalization, distrust, coming 18 months, throughout 18 months of massive policy failures and informational failures. The trust level is not such that we can afford a wedge like that, particularly, Anthony, as we now know, I know you are not a Trumpian. I am not a Trumpian. I'm a conservative. I'm a Republican. Republican, you're probably a bit more moderate, centrist, sometimes some issues even leftist than I am. But my point is both of us are not coming here from a MAGA perspective. You're not coming from a pure anti-MAGA and I'm not anywhere near that world. It's just that that's not who are the unvaccinated problem right now. The problem of unvaccinated is poor and uneducated and minority areas that uh, is or, or already immune. And, and that makes this entire thing categorically different from polio and smallpox is that we have a massive amount of natural immunity that policymakers have refused to talk about. So there's a lot I just put out there in sort of a prima facie response, but I just wanna make very clear, I share the goal of getting more vaccinated. I simply believe a federal mandate will hurt that objective. Okay, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. So, uh, and, I probably am leftist on a few issues, which I actually think are libertarian issues like sex. Um, I don't care what people do in their bedrooms. I don't understand why uh, my conservative friends, they want a smaller government every place, but in my bedroom, they want a larger government. I don't, I don't get well, that. But so Anthony, I, that, I line is, that, Anthony, that line's adorable and it's cute and it's been used forever, but abortions don't take place in a bedroom. So pro-life people are not trying to regulate what happens in a bedroom. They can be wrong on the issue. They can be right on the issue. But that's not a fair thing to say about pro-life. They're oh, either no, I was right really more wrongly. talking about, I, I, I wasn't addressing pro-life. I was really talking about same-sex uh, relationships. I wasn't really talking about pro-life. Pro-life is a separate issue. I'm obviously a Catholic. Um, and Well, uh, then your position I'm, on it's already known. You're pro-life. Yeah, I'm, I am pro-life. Okay. okay. Uh, having said that, my religious beliefs, I don't believe I can impose on others. So we can have that debate too, if you want to have that debate, but let's, but, but I am pro-life because I got raised as a Catholic and I accept the church doctrine as it relates to it. Uh, you know, what I, what I tell people is I'm for less abortions. Okay. Why can't we use other methods of birth control and do everything we can to eliminate abortions? Well, you know, I think, Anthony, your church has spoken on that too, my friend. What's that? Your church has spoken on that issue as well. No, I understand that. Listen, I, mean, I, I have the I get to be smart alecky here because I'm a Protestant. But either way, we're, we're yes. we, we don't have to go down the path. No, I'm let, generally let's libertarian. Go, let, on let's this let's, stuff let's too. stick on the vaccine yeah. for a second, okay? Let's say that you and I are in the White House Situation Room, and which is an interesting place. I've been in the White House Situation Room, and we're sitting there, and now we got some big decisions to make. And I sat down with you and I said, okay, here are the R knots. Here are the exponential effects of these viruses, you know, and so the Delta variant has an eight. The original variant started at a two, we got it down to below nine. Now, what is an R naught, just for everybody listening? It is, I'm sick, how many people am I going to affect on that day, infect with my illness? And so if you're below one, you can get the thing contained, the shedding stops, 
and you get to herd immunity. If you're above two, you are going to exponentially create a pandemic. So the Delta variant is at an eight, and the original COVID-19 SARS-2 uh, uh, was at a two. We got it down to a 0 0.9. We're in the White House Situation Room. I tell you, here are the facts. If we do the following mitigation steps, we're going to reduce the deaths. We know the issue and the trade-offs of freedom. But we're going to lose a half a million people if we mishandle this. If we really mishandle it, we're going to lose 750,000 people. Now, I think that's a war. Now, we could disagree, but I think that's a war. If I'm sitting in the White House Situation Room and I'm talking about a casualty count from an invisible enemy, and I look at the casualties of World War I, casualties of World War II, the Korean War, the, the two Iraq wars and the Afghanistan war, I'm saying, okay, this is actually where we're at war uh, and a result of which what are we going to do to protect the American people as it relates to our leadership? Now, sometimes when you're making those decisions, you, you chip away at certain things, right? We both have a First Amendment right, but we don't have a First Amendment right to do certain things that could potentially harm other people. You have the right to move your arm. I can move my arm, but I can't clench my fist and move my arm into your face. That's not part of my freedom, okay, because it's now in a situation where it can harm others. And so last point, you've got a million hospital beds in the United States, and you and I both know that our census is probably wrong. We probably have 345 million people because we do have a lot of untracked immigration into the country, illegal immigration, and it's mm. probably close to 345 million people. We have 1 million hospital beds. And you got healthcare workers, many of which are in my family, you're going to stress them out of their minds. So to me, you know, and then we can have the debate over the efficacy and the safety of the vaccines. The FDA has just ruled at least one of those mRNA vaccines is safe. And I think to me- Well, no, they had ruled they were all safe. They just hadn't given anything beyond emergency use authorization. Right. Okay. Which, but which I'm, I'm saying involved, yeah. okay, you're getting an extra layer of authorization bureaucratically, yeah, yeah, yeah. which may yeah. provide comfort to some people. But yeah. I think you and I are going to stipulate that we both think that the vaccine is safe. Now, all, saying, all three of the U.S. vaccines are safe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to, we're going to agree on that. So yeah. therefore, like we had a draft mandate, which is a certain abrogation of freedom. We, we instituted a draft. If you were above the age of 18 and a male, you went to selective yeah. service, you got drafted, you didn't want to go to the war, you yeah. went to jail, okay? And that's an abrogation of freedom, but you were at a higher cause fighting for the in general freedom. Make one last point. Once in a while, we have to conjoin ourselves and we have to band together and subordinate ourselves to the greater good of our health and safety and our social contract and your freedom, David, and my freedom and the free market, by the way, the commercial capitalism in our country is actually tied together. It's a weird thing. Yep. We, we are always operating in a collective capitalist environment because you know you got an amazing business and I know your teammates well. There's no David Bonson without the team behind David Bonson. There's no Skybridge without the team. There's no Met, Yankee, Pickett. Every organization has to succumb to some level of collectivity in order for them to grow and nourish their capitalism. And, and I'm so, saying this, and so in our I'm country, this on a Anthony, meta way, we have to do that on a meta way societally. And we need good leadership to explain that to the American people. Okay, so I don't want to say this for clickbait, shock jock, or, or uh, unfair, inflammatory sensationalism, but I'm just starting at the extreme level of what people can mean by that, that greater collective good as part of our national identity, taken to its extreme, you would agree, that there was a Rousseauian context there that was very fascist, that was very nationalistic. It was Hitlerian, it was Mussolini. It was, it, it was at an extreme level, which you're not advocating, and obviously I'm not advocating. One can take it to those degrees. Um, and then there is a kind of American ethos that also calls for greater community good, being part of the national politic, being part of the fabric of the country. And I would argue that the key distinction 
is not just a difference of degree, but a difference of kind that in our version of the community responsibility you describe back to your Catholic faith, we have something that is like a subsidiarity. It is local. Washington, D.C., in our country, has never been the ideal for top-down implementation of community living, of local bonding together to care for one another. That is best done in our country's tradition and in our country's ideals at a local level, community level, which is the idea of federalism when it's politicized and it's the idea of subsidiarity when it is applied in, in a different context. My view here is that, that the idea of a mandate for the vax to get to where you want to go destroys a limiting principle. I believe that there's a limiting principle to my freedom. Your analogy with the fist and the hand, and you know, we can move our arm around, but we can't hit someone in the face. There's a limiting principle to what we can do with our arm. This is so much of what it means to be a conservative is the belief in limiting principles. There is, we have so many more dying, 1.35 million people a year globally dying of car accidents. And there is ample reason to suggest we need to just knock it off with this thing called cars and quit driving. And I'm in the White House Situation Room and I say, this has become massive. There's too many people dying. We've tried now for a hundred years to stop it. We've mitigated, we've done seatbelts, we've done airbags and we've done and better road safety, but gosh darn it, people are still dying. And if I'm gonna be a wartime president, I have it got is, to eliminate little, automobiles. It is a little different though, because- It's a lot different. You know, it is because the automobile incidents and casualties are discrete. And in a pandemic, the potentiality for death is exponential. But what we have right now, I wouldn't have agreed with this a year ago either. But what we have right now is an explosion of cases that the proportionality of deaths to cases in the winter of this year and in summer of last year was eight times more than the proportionality of deaths to cases going back one week, two weeks, three weeks, five weeks, seven weeks, nine weeks. So we do not have um, the same fatality risk because most of the people that are getting this technical positivity right now are younger and healthier. And there is such a high degree of vaccine penetration that we've had a lot of mitigation but even to your point of spread, what we have is urgency, is your argument. And I'm simply saying on that line, we have urgency with heart disease, but we do not ban French fries. We have urgency with alcohol abuse. We tried prohibition. It didn't go very well. So I just am not those, clear. Those, okay, so this is the debate because those are different. They are different because if I create heart disease in myself, I don't have the ability to shed the heart disease onto somebody else. Oh, no, no, Anthony, you don't have the ability to shed COVID to somebody else who's vaccinated. There's no difference. The, 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 it's the, the vaccinated are not at risk from the it, unvaccinated. It, it, it's the unvaccinated are at risk to the unvaccinated, David. Oh, oh Un my, point, my point is then they are each person A, there's three people. Unvax A, unvax B, and vax C. So you agree, you and I are vax C. We're out, we're good. Totally agree. Va unvax A and unvax B are not at risk because of each other. They're at risk because of what they've done, which is choose not to get vaccinated. Their, their risk is not from unvax A. Their unvax B is only at risk because no, unvax but, B but, chose but not to be vaccinated. People in the society like my seven and four-year-old that can't get vaccinated. And so they're now putting people at risk. Oh, no, no, no. Your seven-year-old and four-year-old have a lower chance of dying from COVID than getting hit by a lightning that, bolt. David. Come on, come on. There are seven and four-year-olds and three-year-olds that have been on You can't change the federal constitution because you don't know that. What but, we know, David, you, what on, we, know there's you're, three, you're, we know there's 320 you're, deaths. You're, you just told me that an unvaccinated person can infect an unvaccinated person. My seven and four-year-old are unvaccinated not because... I mean, if I could get them vaccinated, I would get them vaccinated. So now they're, they're not at risk, risk of COVID, though. Because Anthony. of the they are, David. Oh, of, of course. course they are. I mean, we know they that are. they're. What do you mean they're at risk of COVID? Of dying of COVID? They have a potentiality to die unnecessarily. They have a potentiality of dying walking on the street that is higher. 
of being on a freeway that is higher. David, now, David, that, that's just a, a statistical but, fact. But, but, but we're, looking we're to now, the data now, of how many people now, under too, 18. We're now too deep into a rabbit hole. We're now All too right. deep into a rabbit hole. You have, a, you have a pandemic going on. You've already had 600,000 people die in the United States related to the pandemic. Yep. We're losing 1,000 people a day. Well, it's, it's 420 over people over the last seven days now, but it was it got up to 1,000 for one week with Delta. That is true. Yeah, okay. So it's I mean, now we, substantially we, come we down. We like average it out. Let's say it's 500 a day. So yeah. 500 a day, we're going to lose another 150 to 170,000 people because it variates, we fluctuates. Why? You and I both know that a vaccine will get us to herd immunity, will stop the virus shedding. But, and you and I both know that that will also you and I both know that that will improve the economy, that will open up the economy. Of course it would. And create my, my, more know, freedom for our society. What's the leap you're this taking? Is, though? If, you're, if you're making a freedom argument, the most free we can be as a society is if we vaccinate. That's the I most know. free we can be. Okay, but it's begging the question, though. The, the most free we can be is if we freely vaccinate. To force the decision, how many people that are unvaccinated have antibodies? You don't know. What's your guess? I don't know the answer to okay, that. Okay, but no, do I, you, so you gonna... acknowledge in a common sense perspective that it's millions of people? Yeah. Millions uh, of people. Uh, you see, you see, this is where this is where we're both getting stuck. Okay. No, but when you, I, I'm asking, I'm I'm not, I, I'm not making a conclusion both yet. I'm stuck. asking the question. Well, this is where I'm both getting stuck because you see, you're a way more normative person than me. Okay, okay. and you have tremendous idealism in your personality, yeah. and I understand where you're going with your concept of freedom. Okay, but I'm actually looking at the reality and the totality of the situation. Right. And what I'm saying is real leadership once in a while requires that a leader does the cost benefit analysis yeah. and makes a tough decision on behalf of a population. As an example, if you and I were alive in 1861, when Abraham Lincoln took parts of the constitution and yeah. demolished them, including the writ of habeas corpus. And now we could debate whether the Southern states had the right to secede. Pauline Meyer, who's now deceased, the leading constitutional historian, wrote several great books, but one of them was on the Constitutional Convention. In order to get the Southern states to ratify the convention, Constitution, they had the right to secede. So when they executed the right to secede, it was within their constitutional rights. Well, first of all, that is completely untrue that they had the constitutional right. It's a subject of unbelievable controversy. It can't just be stated as fact. Uh, there is no enumerated power to secession to states in the constitution, but, but either way, okay. I'm willing it, to- It wasn't, I'm willing it to accept wasn't settled until 1869 with Brown versus Texas. But you know, no, 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 my point yeah. is that Lincoln took extraordinary steps and you're saying that that was what a great leader in the midst of a wartime did. And now rhetorically, I think it sounds great to say a strong wartime president, because COVID is a big deal, is going to take extreme steps. So we're we're on the same. I don't same think it's that is. extreme of a step, though. Uh, so well, our, well, our, no, our children this, have vaccine this, mandates. I'm asking you. I'm asking you questions. Can't get it's not into a public school without the vaccines, David. I'm not asking. I know, but again, o the, polio, the, smallpox, measles. My kids have. Excuse me. Are your kids vaccinated? Of no, course, on all of them. Go to the school. On all of them, but um, first of all, they don't have to go to the school. Second of all, there is a fatality rate that is so categorically different. It, it, it basically, the lack of limiting principle could lead to an unbelievable um, slippery slope of where we go with this by medicalizing such a, a way of thinking. But, but I want to go back to what I said about natural immunity, because it's not about me being normative. I always think it's a little unfair. I think it's effective in an argument, like rhetorically but how one person's being normative and the other person's being a realist. Like, no, I'm being a realist about the state of the country's division and the distrust that exists on the ground of people with their government, a distrust that's mostly been earned. I want people to be vaccinated by guys like you and I, who people look up to and we have a little bit of credibility and we have a microphone, convincing people, persuading people. And to the extent at the end of the day, we can't get 100% of them vaccinated, they are taking risk only with themselves. 
You point out, well, no, there's still risk for a four-year-old and seven-year-old. My point is that's certainly not a fatality risk and you know it. The fatality risk to the four-year-old and seven-year-old is zero. So we don't have a risk in our country with COVID of fatality, which is the wartime, we we the wartime don't. picture you're painting. Let me just finish this thought. We both don't know the, the long-term effects of COVID on you. Okay, children. but you can't, but Anthony, that's a different argument. You can't now set policy on things we don't know in the future. Uh, we can no, only set no, it on what we do know. And yeah, my point and so is that I want more people to be vaccinated. And once we say the government's making you do it, less people are going to do it. And I think that you and I have other arenas that we can spread this message. Once you go to Washington DC's making you, you lose community buy-in, it's top down, it's not bottom up. It isn't being done out of that sense that you're describing the real American ethos. Your, so, your point about the distrust in the government and your point about the distrust in the establishment is well-founded. And I have said that repeatedly. I've said that on the public airwaves. That and, and the neighborhood I grew up in where my cousins are clamming and they're in the auto glass business or they're cutting baloney, my cousins have a very steep and very deep distrust in the establishment, medical, political, and otherwise. And, and you it's, not are, they're not, it's not based and on I, them wearing a red hat. It's not. I'm, 100%. And I'm going to cede the point to you that it has been well earned that we have faltered over the last 25 years. Uh, where in 1970, perhaps there was more trust or even going back further prior to the Vietnam War, even more trust coming out of the Second World War. Yeah. But, but I'm, so, so that's your reality. And perhaps I'm being more normative about where the state of the society is, okay? So let me ask you this question. If the society had more trust in the government, and let's say it was 1953, 1955, when trust levels in the establishment were at all time highs. Would that make you change your mind about a, a mandate? No, I don't think that you can um, have a mandate on a 0.2% fatality um, when right now the immunity rate is somewhere, according to Fauci, over 70%, according to other scientists at Johns Hopkins, Harvard, Stanford, over 80%. I don't think that you have the compelling case for federal mandate. The 30%, see, this is why I'm surprised your side brings up smallpox, because it really does open the door for my side to say, Anthony, it's 0.2% versus 30%. Everyone, that's not that's not being fancy with numbers. That's such a just substantial difference. Okay, well, hold on a second. So if the number was that high, you would be for the mid. If we had a 30% fatality rate with a, a particular disease, then I think that it would it would be a much more compelling argument. Now then I'd have to look at what the pre-infection rates are and and other such you know distinctives with smallpox, of course, the pre most of the people had died, right? We have because it's such an unbelievably small fatality rate with COVID-19, we, and, and this is the part I wanted you to answer because I'm really curious what you think. Um, we're not going to say her name on the podcast, but I had a fight, uh, or not a fight, I had a conversation with someone at the steakhouse that, that you own in New York City last week who was upset about having to be vac vaccinated when she had already had COVID. And she's someone who's kind of on your side politically, a reasonable, grown-up, successful professional. And that's the thing I'm hearing all over now. It's not MAGA people. And, and, and I guess it's a sad reality for me, but I don't actually have street level conversations with the, with the poor, more rural people. Why is she, there's no, there's, why is that person upset? There's no mandate at this point. They don't have to. Oh down. no, she still had to do it to get into a restaurant, like your restaurant. Oh, to get in a restaurant. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's different. Well, isn't that the free enterprise system? It is. Well? No, 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 no. She was only know, talking about the theoretical possibility of a federal. No, I understand yeah. that. But in a free enterprise system, yeah, the restaurants I, have a, if I, I own a restaurant, you. do I have a right to impose a vaccine mandate? So, so hear me out so you can appreciate how normative I am, how consistently conservative I am. I'm critical of Governor DeSantis telling businesses they can't mandate it. I'm hyper defensive of him prohibiting the um, requirement of the mandate. But, that, but then I think he went too far by actually saying a business couldn't mandate it. And so I'm trying to be right in the lane. It's not libertarian. It's a classical liberal position that we don't have the situation that requires it and where we have uh, anecdotal support 
for okay. building so immunity. You, you we, no one's able Norwegian... to account for what we're going to do with the 20 to 30 million people that already have immunity. And by the way, have more antidotes than the vaccinated. So you agree that Norwegian cruise lines, yeah. their own business. Yes. They have a right a to mandate a vaccine. And no problem. And if you don't want to go on their ship, then it's no problem. You know, you yes. don't want to get, okay. All right. All right. So really not that far apart, David, I guess, I guess the concern that I have and, and, uh, is the, the, and, and the statistical number 0.2% sounds low, but the absolute number where I think we're going to end up 750 to a million people. And you're saying, well, that's we're just not like going to get to a million, my friend. We're not going to get to a million. I think we get to 750. Um, you, by the way, are you? I, I, this is a rabbit hole too. There okay. is the, the with you're, you're COVID, at 620 the with, now. You don't think another no, 130,000 people the, are going to die? The 620 from this? is with COVID, not from COVID. The CDC has the asterisks and footnotes all over their website. They audited the numbers in San Jose. They audited it in counties in Wisconsin. Ended up determining somewhere between 30 and 50 percent did not die from COVID, but it says COVID on their death certificate because they had COVID when they died. I mean, listen, my the, I don't know. That, we're never going to know, though. I don't. My, I'm not my, a conspiracy guy listen, on it. I'm just there, saying there it's are not people that, that got COVID. There are people that got COVID. They recover from COVID. And then they died from an associated blood clot related to yeah. COVID. They're not listed as COVID deaths. They're listed as dying from heart attacks or blood clots. I, I understand that. I'm just saying to you that, and perhaps this is where we should both end up, is that we have to figure out a way to restore trust in our society, that we have let down a very large group of people, David, um, the people I grew up with were, were aspirational. This was our conversation first time that we got together on your podcast are now economically desperational and they are pissed off and they want to put a finger in your eye and my eye on Wall Street. They want to put a finger in the eye of the people in Washington and anybody that they see that has taken too much cake from the system and hasn't shared enough cake with them. And I'm not talking about sharing it with them socially through socialism i'm talking about this the opportunity set of good education you know look we can agree or disagree on this but i'm all about unequal outcomes but our society is rich enough where we have to create a platform of equal so so can I, so can i reinforce what you're saying and apply it to the covid moment please you, you are you are right the way i dress and the and the income and life i have a lot of those people would would not like me but they should because I'll fight to my dying in day for those people. Everything I care about for the aspirational society is for people to be able to do the things with their life that you did with yours and I did with mine. Okay, so uh, through the COVID moment, I'm this Wall Street guy with money that was fighting tooth and nail to get their coffee shops open, their delis open, to allow the, uh, some uh, uh, ability to, for economic living and activity. What did the left-wing people who say they care about those people do? They were on their Zoom calls, riding their Pelotons, not leaving their houses, and more or less totally okay with leave, staying in the house as long as it needs be. So my view on these things is for that guy that girl, that aspirational need in these communities. That is what drives me here. And when you say we have responsibility to rebuild trust, I agree 100%. I can't stand the media business model that each side is trying to provoke outrage in their own respective bases. They're never trying to speak to their audience. They're trying to speak for their audience. I can't stand it. We can't help the trust problem by federal mandating of vaccines right now. And we can't help the trust problem by continuing to ignore natural immunity. We have to have honest conversations. I don't blame any of the science, public health guys, whatever, for being wrong on things. I'm not looking for gotcha moments. I didn't even really blame Trump for being wrong on this stuff. It's like, at the end of the day, these guys, it's difficult to have to do what they're doing. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. Fauci got some things wrong. He got some things right. I'm not looking to pile on anybody. But we can't go out and do things that we know are going to make the matter worse with public trust when we have strategies that can help. We can get, first of all, why the hell did it take the FDA this long for full approval of the Pfizer vaccine? 
We already have had 130 million get the vaccine. There, were, there was no reason to not say, okay, it has full approval. And so things like that bureaucracy lead to the distrust. Ignoring natural immunity leads to the distrust. Making a kid mask up going outdoors at the playground leads to the distrust. There's things we can do to rebuild the fabric of society that helps the people you and I both talk about and care about. Let me, and I, and, and I agree with all that. So I'm not gonna, I'm not, I have nothing to add, but I wanna ask you an additional question, okay? Uh, if you had a friend that was unvaccinated, what would you say to that friend to encourage them to be vaccinated? Uh, well, if they lived in New York, I would say you're not going to be able to get into a restaurant if you, <laughs> if you don't get vaccinated. But no, the thing, if they had had COVID before, it, I would have a difficult time trying to press the issue because the, scientifically they have, an, they have antibodies and it's, and it's a tough thing to argue with. I would maybe point out that we don't know how long the antibodies will last and why not just get it done so you have it in the future. But for a vulnerable person, to their knowledge, hasn't had COVID before, and we see all of it, I would point out that there's an infection risk to others, and there is their own health and well-being. And if they're in you know, uh, an adult range of, uh, of need, I would just say, like any other health measure, why not go forward and do it, take care of yourself, and in the same time, do some good for the society. You just don't want that mandated. Not federally mandated. I think Norwegian cruise lines can have their mandates. I think employers can have their mandates. Now, of course, then the thing ends. You, you can say at Skybridge, you have to mandate. I didn't mandate it at Bonson Group, but um, at Skybridge, someone can quit if they don't want to do it and come work for Bonson Group, right? There's all there, 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 there's different I, I made, freedoms. I made, I made the decision to mandate it because I've got, I, I'm looking at it as a leader and I'm looking at the totality of the safety of the vaccine, vaccines, and I'm looking at the health of my employees and their family members and my elderly parents and other employees, elderly parents. And I said, we're going with the vaccine mandate. You don't want to work at Skybridge. Absolutely no problem. We'll help you find another job. Go look somewhere else. And by the way, it's the same thing with our conference. You know, yeah. Allen and company, fully vaccinated. Mike Milkins coming to the Hamptons this weekend. You got to be fully vaccinated. We're I having did, a yeah, I did your, uh, the SALT uh, thing on clear yesterday, you know, uh, <laughs> where, can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, that's yeah, the I got I, I got yeah. you you scan in your Vax card and clear runs a little bar QR thing and all that. Because, because I, I now know if you're coming into the conference and some of it is indoors and some of it is outdoors, your vaccination will protect you and it will protect the other people in the room. And so yes. all I'm saying to you intellectually is there are points of time where the individual freedom and the freedom of the entire society, they rub against each other. You're suggesting they may be rubbing right now, but they're not on a collision course, so you're okay with it. I'm suggesting they're more on a collision course. And by the way, I can tell you why we are basically in agreement, David, because when you increase the mortality to 32%, you more carefully considered my argument about a mandate. At 0.2%, you're saying, no, we're rubbing, we're not colliding. I'm looking at the absolute number, the 650,000. But, but you're, not saying, really, you're not really, because you wouldn't apply, you would not ban French fries tomorrow. And obesity is a far bigger killer right, than well, COVID. How do you and feel by, about, and by the way, Anthony, by the way, obesity, the, obesity was the number one comorbidity with COVID. It's only because of this politically correct nonsense we live in that we're not allowed to talk about obesity for what it really is. No, we have I, to. I, I look. I hate the political correct wokeness as much as you do. But 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 what about seatbelts? Okay, we know you said one point five. I'm, 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 the seatbelt issue never needed to be done federally. It could always have been done locally. So this is not this is not a normative thing. It's about the system that we you're chose okay, to live in. You're okay with the seatbelts or you're not? I'm, okay? I'm, I believe that two things are true at once. The seatbelt always should have been done at a local level and the, at a federal level, um, the, those things have been effective. 
but but we have to look to not just the security but the freedom this is as old as ben franklin's famous line i and i and i and i know i know the line well but here's the point you, you just met one and a half million people are dying from the car accidents less are dying as a result of the seat belts being put on we we know that i mean that's mm -hmm. factually correct and so there's some rub between freedom and the overall society, the pressure on the health system. But not all system. things the federal, federal government, see, this is the non sequitur of it. Alcohol is a killer. Alcohol abuse is a killer. It's, it's not just a, a mortality contributor. It kills families. It kills jobs. It kills economic success. It kills the soul. Okay. Yeah. Prohibition was a dastardly federal failure. Yes. So we so it's a non sequitur to say that whenever there's a big problem, we need I a federal accept, solution that is mandated. I, I, I accept that. But I think what's uh, ironic about this entire conversation is we're actually way closer yeah. than people would actually think, because we're both concerned about the liberty. I believe me, I don't want to federally impose anything unless it's in an extremist situation where it's gonna make the society freer and more generally protective. And I understand the nuance, David, between individual freedom and the comity that we need together to stay free. You know, once in a while, we gotta join forces to fight evil, frankly, to keep ourselves free. And so, and so, and with that comes all of those convoluted choices. Last point on that topic is, I know for certain, and, I can share with you and your listeners for certain, and I can recommend books to read, and I can you can talk to people in our national security complex who are apolitical, guys like General McMaster, okay? For certain that the former Soviet Union, the people that are now running Russia are, and I'll use the quote from President Putin himself, the worst thing that happened in the 20th century was the demolition of the Soviet Union. Not World War I, not World War II, but the demolition of the Soviet Union. And he blames the West. And they are using weapons grade propaganda on this nation, France, Germany, the United Kingdom. Sputnik, the state owned news agency, just staffed up in Scotland with the expectation and hope that they can create enough ire in Scotland to disassociate the Scots from the United Kingdom. And we have to be more open to and explanatory about that. And you're right about the social media stuff. A thousand percent agree with you on that. The economic engine of self-interest of those social media players have allowed for that proliferation. I have a million Twitter followers. God only knows how many Russian bots there are. I have no idea, maybe half of them, I have no idea. But the notion that I have a million Twitter followers makes that more powerful from a projection perspective for the social media enterprises and frankly, people like me. And so they're left alone. OK, and I think it's a mistake. And then you say, well, what about the freedom of that corporation to allow for that? And I would say no to that, OK, because I would say that it is actually hurting our freedom and it's but, ruining but again, not, the unity of the sense, United States. This isn't a liberty definition of freedom fraud is not freedom okay uh, you know corruption and there are various okay, elements in in commerce in free exchange so, so then we do agree that there are certain lines i am the yeah. ceo of a social media company i've decided to allow fraud which is no. i don't view or deem to be harmful david can replicate himself 400 times on my social media platform it's not a credit card it's just a it's a way for him to express so, himself anonymously. Is, replicate myself is different. I'm allowed to have 10 credit cards in my name. It's with fake identities that are allowing for well, federal anonymous. intervention. Well, well, well we I'm, already I'm, have I'm, we already have restrictions against but federal I'm now corruption. the CEO of that social media. But David, it's just anonymous expression of free speech. All, That's all, all I'm is. saying is that I don't want to engage the conversation with by pretending there's not trade-offs. That is, you know, I have a book coming out called There's No Free Lunch. 
in this I, case, in this case, we can find the right policy juxtaposition of freedom and security. We can't do it by pretending that everybody can win, that you're going to get your spinach and it's all going to taste like dessert. I, I have is, enormous, I have an enormous amount of respect for you intellectually. You have moved me. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm man enough to admit when I moved in, in, a, in a conversation, I don't have to be that it's my way or the highway sort of a guy. You have moved me. Okay. But therefore, okay, if it's not federally mandated, you and I and people like you and I, we need to figure out a way to impress and influence as many people as possible to get the safe vaccine answers. We just need I to agree. And I'm doing everything in my power to do that. Perhaps I'm overreaching with a federal mandate. I accept your position that there's not enough trust in the system. But it's interesting that you can't be that far away from me because on smallpox with a 30% mortality, you're like, okay, that could be an extremist enough of a situation where we have to do things like that. And even then, though, I, I think it's entirely possible from a 10th Amendment standpoint, it could have been done at the state level. There's other nuances, but my point is it's an extreme case that would have required extreme policy response. And there's not an absolutism that, that says people should be free to go out and, and kill tons of other people. The infectiousness there and the fatality uh, reached a certain uh, uh, bar. That in, in this case, it works as a, a counter argument on COVID yes. because the mortality is so small. But Anthony, I think you said it earlier when you asked me, what would you do if you had a friend? The number one thing that's going to get someone to go get vaccinated is their friend their family member, their spouse, their brother, their sister. That's subsidiarity. That's the Catholic doctrine of okay. people in the, see the government can't love you. I understand and, that. Your friend can, and we can do it locally. And then one step up from that, that doesn't get anywhere near Washington, DC, but is just Skybridge, it's Salt, it's Bonson Group, it's conversation, it's media appearance. So we have so many vehicles that I don't just think are adequate. I think they're far superior here to federal mandate. And then we leave more social fabric fabric uh, together. There's still more cohesion to build off of. And ultimately, we will get that immunity, immunity throughout the society that we need without then having contributed to the trust problem you and I both care about. I agree. And I want to make one last point because I think it's an important one. If because when you when you're talking about the individual, I don't want the individual to make their decision not to be vaccinated based on fraud. As an example, is there a microchip in the vaccine? There is no microchip in the vaccine. You know, is the is it is it are there mRNA in there that's destroying or affecting your genetic code? There's no scientific evidence of that. Okay, but let's let's do this right for both of our sake. Yeah. yeah. Bill Gates, microchip global conspiracy, all of this stuff, nonsense. And is the person prone to believe it going to be persuaded by a federal vaccine? Are they going to cooperate with a federal no, vaccine? You're, you're right about that. They will double down on the nonsense. Double down, so, triple so, down, so grab I'm, a gun. God knows I'm, what they I'm going to leave you with this thought, okay? Because again, I love the country. I love the American experience and the American experiment. And I want to make it better for everybody, as you know, and particularly because of my upbringing, I have a lot of empathy for people that were situated the way I was 35 short years ago. Uh, we got to make it better, brother. Yeah. Okay, we got to make it better. We have to break it down. We have to communicate more. And so I'm very grateful for being included today. I appreciate everything. I love that we're able to work through it together as friends points of agreement, some points of disagreement, but honestly, I've appreciated the time. I hope listeners have as well. I also hope that you will come to the SALT Conference at the Javits Center in New York City, September 13th through 15th, uh, coming back to the world's greatest city in person, some incredible speakers. Uh, and the go, chain go. smokers, and the chain smokers. Yes, and, and that does not refer to people that are going out and damaging their lungs constitutionally. It refers to the great band, the chain smokers. So uh, they're playing, I think, on the second night. Second night, yeah, it'll yeah. be Tuesday night. Guy, uh, you've had some, some great groups over the years at SALT. Um, look, the, the, there's so much fun that is gonna be had at the conference, check it out. I'm sure we'll have Anthony back on Capitol Record. Thanks again, Mooch, appreciate it, my friend. All the best, David, thank you.